Have you ever wondered what it takes to build a portfolio that lasts your entire life? Most families will never actually earn the full cost of their retirement in their wages. So people have to grow their money in order to be able to afford retirement. This is why we invest in the markets. There's compounding growth, which allows us to grow it faster than we're able to earn it. So as we spend money, our portfolios can be growing for us and recover what we've spent. But what should your portfolio look like when you hit that retirement stage? It's completely different than when you've been working and accumulating your money. So today we're gonna cover what you need to know to give you the best chance of not running out of money before you run out of time. If you've not met us yet, my name is Tiago and I run a wealth management firm right outside of Washington, DC. And we specialize in working with successful federal employees. And we do that by focusing on three major retirement components, helping you maintain your lifestyle in retirement, reducing your taxes, and making sure your assets are doing what they need to do so that you have sustainable retirement your whole life. And that third one is what we're gonna focus on today. So building a sustainable retirement portfolio is multifaceted. On the one hand, you need some of that money to pay for lifestyle, like going out and traveling and enjoying your lives. But then on the other hand, you also need parts of that money to be growing for you over time and not being spent because future you is gonna need income just like today you does. And the goal is to always have money from which to make withdrawals to fund your whole life. So how do we accomplish such opposing goals with the same portfolio? We utilize something called the bucket approach. Each bucket represents a different portion of your portfolio and makes up certain ranges of time into the future. The idea is that the sooner you need your money, the less amount of risk you're able to take. And so you want to be in things like cash or cash equivalents, maybe short-term bonds. Again, these are just examples. This is not a specific recommendation for you. Now, as time starts to move forward, that's enough time for inflation to begin eroding the purchasing power of your hard-earned money. So your money needs to be doing something. So maybe we incorporate some US bonds. Maybe we're using a little bit of international bonds. Maybe you're actually starting to invest in stocks just a little bit. And again, the further out you go, the more time you have and the more risk you're able to take in allowing your portfolio to grow for the future years that you need. And realistically, anything eight years and below is rather medium term. It's not until we get to eight to 10 years, possibly even a little longer, that we're looking at very long-term goals where you can be very aggressive. So why is it that we break up portfolios in different segments like this? This is really important. Make sure you get this. Market volatility is a risk to investors in the short term, but it's opportunity for you in the long run. You see, the less amount of time that you have, the more risk you have in taking money from a portfolio when the markets have maybe dropped them in value. Let me show you how this works. But before we do that, if you found this helpful so far and you like what we're doing in these videos, will you hit the thumbs up for us? That lets us know that that's the kind of thing you want to see. And it helps put this video in front of other people that might have to see it too. Okay, so let's look at the risk of pulling your money out of your portfolio when the markets have dropped in value. Let's assume this is your portfolio as it fluctuates in value over time. As you take money out of your portfolio, maybe here, here, and here, you're removing this money out of play and it no longer has the opportunity of regrowing again over time. You may be better suited to have parts of your portfolio or a bucket that behaves more like this instead of so volatile because in this circumstance, okay, maybe you took money when it was low right here, but the distance that it fell is much less than the distance that it fell in this kind of allocation. That's a really big difference in helping you preserve your capital. So that's why we need to have parts of our portfolio that are set up to be short term so that they're not subject to that same kind of volatility that the more aggressive portions of your portfolio have to be doing. On the other hand, if all of your portfolio is set up in this conservative manner, which we've seen a lot this year, a lot of federal employees are 70, 80, 90, 100% G fund. That also removes the opportunity for that money to regrow again at some point. And it also doesn't allow your money to grow fast enough for that future growth that you need. If you think you're gonna be able to get back into the markets, it's really difficult to time when you're ready to get back in because your emotions are driving your decisions. And the markets are trading months ahead of any news that you could hear that would allow you to feel comfortable in redeploying that money again. Now, over time, you need to be rebalancing these buckets as well. As markets go up and down in value, 
each section in each bucket of your portfolio actually changes its composition relative to one another. So your more aggressive portfolio buckets may become bigger parts of your overall wealth if the market is doing well and vice versa. And so this is something called portfolio drift. And we address this with a good investment rebalancing plan. So let's say that this portfolio represents your specific portfolio. This is uh, maybe a 60-40 portfolio with 60% stocks and 40% bonds. As stocks go up in value, you can see that it's possible that now your stocks make up 75% of your portfolio and 25% are now bonds. What have you done by allowing this to happen? This has made your portfolio more aggressive, subject to more volatility, and can harm you in the long run. So a rebalancing plan would come into play and to possibly rebalance the portfolio back to the 60-40 allocation that we determined was necessary for you. So then what if stocks go down? Same thing happens, but the inverse. Now you might be a 50-50 portfolio, which may not be aggressive enough for you to continue to meet your needs. You might run out of money if you don't readdress this, uh, if you don't rebalance this rather, in an appropriate time. So in this circumstance, maybe it makes sense to buy stocks and bring you back up to your stock allocation. This cycle repeats itself over and over as the markets go up and down in value and you have to be adjusting it over time. Okay, so at this point, we generally start getting questions about what kinds of investments go inside each one of those buckets. Unfortunately, that's something that is very personalized. It's different for every family. It's also different in every year. There's things that happen economically. There's things that happen in the markets. So if you need help with this, make sure that you're checking with your advisors on what to do best from there. If you're interested in working with our team, visit our website and be in touch with us there. So you've got your bucketed strategies down. You've figured out your timelines. You know how much is going in each bucket, but how do you know how much money you're going to need in your entire retirement? There's a common article by Fidelity that says it's 10 times your salary by your age 67. But we took a deeper dive into that and realized that there's some serious problems in that analysis. And in this video on the screen, we talk through exactly why Fidelity got this wrong, specifically for federal employees, and what you need to do to make sure that you don't repeat the same mistakes. And I think it's gonna be helpful to you too, so make sure you check that one out. And until next time, stay wise and stay wealthy.